And then I'd like to introduce uh, our co-chair, Trevor Marshall. And, uh, well, there's apparently a lot more to learn about 5 so it's your... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, and thank you, Mr. Diaz. <clears throat> what more is there to discover about vitamin D was the topic I was set. And uh, obviously, there's a lot we still have to learn about vitamin D. Whoops. I have to use this thing, huh? I have to learn how to use the machine first. Okay. <clears throat> Well, firstly, there are a lot of vitamin Ds. Um, the most important of the vitamin D metabolites are something called 2,5-hydroxyvitamin D, which is normally the one that you measure for vitamin D status. But the, from a molecular point of view, the really important one is the 1,2,5-dihydroxy, because that's the one that activates gene translation. Without that 1,2,5-D that is so difficult to measure, we wouldn't have any gene translation. And each cell that produces genes produces its own 1,2,5-dihydroxy vitamin D internally in the cell. The difference between 2,5-D and 1,2,5-D is this single oxygen hydroxyl uh, group here. 2,5-D um, and 1,2,5-D both have the oxygen in that position, but the uh, active position is there. <coughs> The VDR transcribes more than a thousand genes, and I've actually seen maps indicating that it could, could uh, be responsible uh, indirectly or directly for around 20% of the entire genome. It's a very, very important receptor, very, very important function. Now, this is a very complex drawing, and I hesitate to put it up, but I put it up because we need to understand how complex the molecular mechanisms really are. And the reason that we still have no definite answers about exactly what vitamin D does is because it does so very much that each of its actions is hard to measure, hard to isolate, and um, so, so <laughs> that's why I put this up. 1,2,5-D, the 1-alpha-hydroxylase one one gene, is also transcribed by P300 receptor uh, from the DNA and uh, the VDR itself uh, complexes with RxR and works on a VDR response element to transcribe the genes associated with the VDR. I've got a simpler picture, at least I think it's simpler, um, which basically starts here with 7D hydrocholesterol, um, then pre-V vitamin D. Uh, cholesterol is the uh, body substrate from which all of the steroids are produced. Cortisol is produced, estrogen is produced, all of the steroids are produced from cortisol, uh, cholesterol, sorry. And 7-D-hydrocholesterol uh, is changed to a pre-V vitamin D state with an energy change, then to vitamin D, um, calciferol, and then 2,5-hydroxyvitamin uh, D with a hydroxyl, a hydroxylation stage. The, one of the oxygens is put on. Then we have the change to 1,2,5-dihydroxyvitamin D where uh, CYP27B1 is the enzyme which affects that change. And only this 1,2,5-dihydroxyvitamin D is capable of actually activating the VDR to produce the genes. Then in turn, the VDR produces the calcium-sensing receptor, uh, which is responsible, together with PTH, for the calcium balance in the body. But it's an indirect effect. It's a secondary effect. The VDR produces the calcium-sensing receptor. And also the VDR, many of the genes are uh, uh, for pathogen recognition and response. And if you want to read more, there's an essay I wrote on it once. Okay, there are all sorts of problems with the conventional model of how we think vitamin D is generated in the body. It would take me a whole afternoon to even begin to go through each stage and point out that the kidneys really aren't that important Sure, there's 1,2,5-D uh, produced there, but the 1,2,5-D is produced in every cell as well as in the kidneys. And the signaling... Uh, I don't have an afternoon. I'm sorry. Now, the other problem we have... Is it playing the video? Mm -hmm. 
Hello? It was playing. Is it playing the video? It was until you turned it off. <coughs> yeah. Ah. Well, it's not going to play as a video. No, it's playing. Oh, I'm sorry, on my screen it doesn't. Thank you. Uh, okay, what we have here is a VDR, and it's drawn as a series of helices. There are about uh, 100, between 100 and 200 amino acids in this. It's a very complex protein. Um, and so many of those amino acids are drawn in the form of helices, and they're fairly strong helical structures. And there are a number of helices, 12 important helices in the VDR. And this is where the ligand fits in the binding pocket. And when we look at the human and rat VDR, with the human on the left, rat on the right, you can see that this tetrazole uh, moiety on the drug I'm looking at uh, is oriented in a totally different manner for, uh, in the uh, rat and the humans, and also uh, this uh, moiety as well. Because even though the rat and the human seem to have a very similar VDR, when you actually get down to analysing how drugs bind into it and how 125D binds into it, it's a little bit different. So my colleague, uh, Dr. Greg Blaney, at Ljubljana in 2010, uh, pointed out that uh, with his patients, uh, which is a mixed cohort, we'll talk about the diagnosis in, in a while, that um, the number of patients that had uh, elevated 125D, the 125, the active uh, uh, um, the active metabolite was quite high. Only 10 of his 43 patients had their 25D, the normal one you measure, less than 50 nanomoles, whereas quite a lot had the 125D elevated. And he proposed that, in fact, we should be measuring both the 25D and the 125D when we are trying to measure disease status. Um, the 125D goes high, very high. Uh, frequently over 100 picomolar, I think 100, 120 picomolar was the dividing level between uh, sickness and illness that he put um, with a variety of patients, uh, fibromyalgia, um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, osteoarthritis, uh, metabolic disease, multiple sclerosis, variety of diagnoses. Anyway, we wrote this up in uh, Annals of New York Academy of Sciences, and if you're interested in measuring vitamin D status, I recommend that you have a close look at uh, Greg's paper. Now, as we've just heard, vitamin D is a steroid transcriptional activator. It's not a nutrient in the strict term of a nutrient. The body can produce the vitamin D it needs and each cell metabolizes the vitamin D it needs. Each cell, in order to transcribe the DNA. Each cell that transcribes DNA produces the vitamin D it needs. Whereas vitamins are substances which uh, can't be made by the body itself, uh, vitamin D is not a vitamin, it's a transcriptional activator. It activates DNA transcription, a secosteroid. All nucleated cells synthesize all the vitamin D they need. Ingested vitamin D suppresses the immune system as do other steroids, and in the short term, people often feel better as a result of taking it. The problem is, what is the prognosis in the five to ten year time frame? We know that when you're dealing uh, with prednisone, you're talking about side effects and uh, relapses in the five to ten year time frame. We really haven't even got that there uh, with uh, high dose vitamin D supplementation. It's really only in the last five years that we started to apply that to patients. So we really haven't had a chance yet to see a lot of the adverse events that uh, we might predict. Um, why do we say it's um, immunosuppressive? Well, there's a study from um, Canada, uh, which was the final paper produced from the multiple sclerosis study in Canada, uh, found exactly that, that uh, T cell reactivities in the peripheral blood were uh, reduced in, um, by uh, colocalsulfurol in human serum at concentrations higher than 100 nanomoles per, meat, per litre. Now we put together a paper explaining the alternate hypothesis. 
And the alternative hypothesis is that vitamin D that we're measuring in the blood is just a marker. It is purely a marker. Within the cells, the vitamin D level is very important because within the cells it's active. But in the blood, it's not active. And therefore it's just a marker. Both 125D and 25D are just markers. And uh, as I said, in a longer seminar, I could go into detail into to that. VDR is at the heart of innate immunity. It produces uh, catholicidin, which is broken up into many of the most active uh, antimicrobials, endogenous antimicrobials. And what happens is the microbes have evolved away of stopping vitamin D from activating the VDR. They need to do that in order to persist inside cells. The microbiome disables the VDR gene expression of the antimicrobials, or otherwise the antimicrobials would stop those uh, pathogens from invading the cells. And what we found was that there is a drug which does reactivate the VDR. It's off-label, as I declared on my second slide, and my colleague here, uh, Trudy Heil, who's somewhere in the audience, Trudy's down in the front there, uh, has a poster talking about uh, treating 60 or so of her patients with olmosartan with a variety of conditions. Uh, I think she's focusing on metabolic syndrome recovery and there's uh, some diabetes data as well here from a poster. So look up Trudy. Trudy. She's got some printouts uh, with her, I think, that she can give you and uh, you can also look at the poster and obviously chat with her. Now, in this uh, paper we wrote for the latest infection and autoimmunity, we raised something called the U-shaped curve or the V-shaped curve. Sorry, the U-shaped curve or the J-shaped curve. I was looking at my time on the screen, I'm sorry, <laughs> it just cracked me. Uh, the U-shaped curve or the J-shaped curve. And if I bring one of these up, this is a study of the cord blood vitamin D and neurocognitive development um, and shows that they're non-linearly related in toddlers. So what's this got to do with autoimmune disease? Nothing. The reason I chose this particular study to talk about was to emphasize how important the VDR is to so many parts of the body, even to neurodevelopment, um, and not just to a disease. So when we, have, when we measure how our patients respond to vitamin D supplementation, there are many, many factors that we have to take into account, measure and take into account. Anyway, uh, th this particular study showed a fairly typical U-shaped curve. It's inverted U, but uh, th that's just the way they've plotted it. Inverted U, which shows that with the cord blood 2,5-hydroxyvitamin D level, that at about 70 nanomoles, the uh, neurodevelopment is actually retarded that its peak uh, with the cord blood uh, uh, when it's around 40 nanomoles and as the um, level of vitamin D in the cord blood drops then that's also correlated with poor later development in the um, child. But what's particularly interesting here is this fall off, this U-shaped curve because just giving people more vitamin D and more vitamin D does not necessarily improve their response. In fact it almost always decreases their response. And identifying the dose at which the uh, curve starts to fall, either rise if it's a J-shaped curve or fall in the case of a U-shaped curve, is critically important if we want to do studies of clinical response to vitamin D. Uh, whoops. Is that running please? Could you run that? Ah, now what we have here is the VDR again, but this time I've got some of the amino acids split out. I've got two of the amino acids here split out. And you can see oxygens, which are the red um, uh, atoms. You've got nitrogens, which are the blue atoms. Uh, both of them are very highly charged. Um, and up here we have a hydroxy actually specifically shown with the white uh, hydroxy uh, hydrogen attached to the um, oxygen. Now what's particularly interesting is that this is an emulation over a function of time, over about one nanosecond or 10 to the minus nine seconds of the life of a VDR or the activity of a VDR. 
And what you've got is all these molecules are moving. That's fine, all the molecules in the human body are moving, and they're moving at a very, very fast rate, what is often called a terahertz rate. And when you have moving charges, and these are highly charged atoms, when you have moving charges, you have waves. And the question that has now arisen is, okay, well, if you have waves being generated by these moving charges, then the trajectory of these moving charges is also going to be affected by waves coming in to the molecule. Those of you that are interested in the quantum theory behind all this um, can look up these uh, papers. They go into it in some detail. But if we just take the uh, simple VDR um, uh, picture like the one I just showed you, the emulation, then you can see that as a function of time, from time zero, the number of hydrogen bonds formed between the ligand and the VDR changes as the ligand and the VDR settle down into a stable position. And this oscillation can become unstable if energy is put in at this particular point. And it appears as though the oscillation might be at something called 6 gigahertz. When we do an FFT of the data, we find in fact there is a good peak at around 6 gigahertz, another one at 30, 20, 60. Why does that matter? Well, this room is flooded with 6 gigahertz from Wi-Fi. 802.11ac running at 5.8 gigahertz is flooding this room with energy. Does it affect our VDRs? Who knows? So if we look at the um, situation with 125d into the receptor, once again you can see the cyclic nature, the time variability. So now it's on a slightly longer time scale. And when we do the FFT, we actually find that there are peaks now as low as 1 gigahertz, which is closer down to the cell phone range of uh, frequencies. So that the, this molecule is somehow being affected. How? At what amplitudes? What we produced was a little cap, which I'll try and find the bottom off so I can put it on. This cap to stop waves getting to the head of our cohort. And we sent them out to volunteers, 46 volunteers, asking them to wear it four hours during sleeping and four hours during daytime and tell us is there any change. This cap has got silver threads in it. So in addition to the bamboo structure of the fabric, it's got silver threads that stop the waves from getting into the cap. That protects primarily the um, lymph nodes here that where the uh, brain drains, also the uh, st uh, brain stem obviously. You can see the bamboo threads interspersed with the silver. And we were surprised by the results, very surprised. People in their patients, in their normal home environments found that putting the shielding hat on made a difference to their symptoms. And what's more, we found that 90% reported a definite or strong effect, 2% or 1 out of 64 with no effect, and uh, 4 patients reported a weak effect. But 90% reported definite or strong effects. So as if physicians didn't have enough to worry about, now we also have to worry about is somehow the uh, environment, the uh, electromagnetic environment of the patients perhaps uh, compromising or changing their uh, response to therapy, uh, changing their response to uh, the, uh, the disease state as well.